Hey everybody, uh, we're going to get started here. Um, let me turn off this music. Hope you enjoyed some Jack Johnson mu music uh, here. So, hi everybody, my name is John Ziola. Thanks for coming to Still City InfoSec. That is where you are. If that's not where you expected to be, there's the door and there's the, you know, the Ally 226 offices are down that way. <laughs> um, again, like I said, my name is John Ziola. I run this group uh, called Still City InfoSec. I've had a lot of great hope lately, so I want to give a big thank you to uh, Kyle and Joe here. Raise your hands. Those guys are, uh, have been assisting me. Yep. <laughs> have been a huge hand uh, and a huge help to me recently. Um, uh, I don't know if you, uh, some of you guys know, you know, my wife just had a baby on the first, and so I didn't go through that. That's why I'm wearing purple, because she was a girl. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I've been, I've been really busy lately with that, and a few other things have really stepped up and helped. Uh, and then another thank you uh, to this unsung hero back here, Brian Gray, who's been setting up all of these recordings and makes this stuff available online, so a big thank you to him as, as well. Um, so we're going to get started here in a minute. I just had a couple... Uh, couple things to cover at the beginning. So if you guys are looking for the bathrooms, go out the store, take an immediate left, and kind of go down the hallway. The men's and women's rooms are, are down that way. And, um, and you know, we've got this area until, I think, 8.30 or 9 o'clock tonight. So uh, feel free to hang around afterwards and talk. You know, I'm sure Jim will be around for a little bit to chat, and I definitely will be. So, uh, so one other thing I want to cover is, oh, that today is a Wednesday. Uh, for new people, that might not be that surprising, but for people who have been around with the group for a long time, this group has always met on the second Thursday of the night since I started it in 2012. This is really one of the first non-Thursdays that we're doing, and um, I did a poll a little while back, and people kind of liked North Shore area, and they liked Thursday in Oakland, and they liked Thursdays and Wednesdays, so I'm mixing up a little bit and doing a Wednesday on the North Shore as opposed to a Thursday or a Thursday in Oakland or whatever. So um, if this time works for you, you know, that's great. Let me know that on the meetup. If it, if it was really inconvenient and you would prefer a Thursday, but you came anyways, please let me know that as, as well. Or if you're watching online and on the recording, you know, please let me know if, if Thursdays are better than Wednesdays, if, you know, Oakland versus North Shore and Pittsburgh, what, what's, what's better, what's more convenient, because this group is meant to be, you know, whatever's easiest for the, the people that would like to attend it. So I wanted to make sure I, gave, I mentioned that. And then I wanted to give a shout out also to this space. So this is a co-working space, and they're giving us this area completely for free, out of the goodness of their heart. And they, um, they really, they really, um, they really seem to have a good thing going here. Um, if, if you haven't taken a tour through the area, you know there's some co-working areas and some offices, and they do a lot of you know month-based, no lease uh, engagements here. So you can, uh, if you if you have a small company, or if you're just looking for a place to work every once in a while, you could come here. Uh, Natalie. Uh, we'll be sitting out kind of towards the front area um, in, the, in the lobby if you guys are interested in, in learning any more about this area. But a big thank you to them for providing this 100% free of cost. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to mention is about sponsors. So we have a sponsor for the first quarter, but we don't have a sponsor for the second quarter or for the third quarter. So if any of you guys work at companies that are in any way related to InfoSec or want to sponsor this group, um, let them know that... I have some sponsorship levels, and or you know if you're responsible for that, feel free to reach out on Meetup, and we can uh, you know I can I can give you essentially the sponsorship information, what it what it costs to sponsor one event or three events, or you can sponsor a whole year. But that being said, tonight's sponsor is CISO. Uh, CISO is great because it's a company that I own. <laughs> um, yeah, CISO is a small info information security consulting company that myself and uh, some others, Joe in the back there. Uh, co-founded recently, and so we're doing information security consulting in the Pittsburgh area in other ways. So if you guys have anything that you'd like to talk about along those lines, feel free to reach out to myself or Joe, and big thank you to CISO for sponsoring this event at the last minute. It's a, I had to work really hard to convince them that they should sponsor this event, but I was able to work it out. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that being said, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Jim. Uh, so Jim is going to be the presenter for tonight. Uh, Jim Plantania is how you say his last name. It took me a little bit of practicing. Um, but uh, he is a developer and he's interested in AppSec and various other things, crypto being one of them. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So let's uh, give him a warm welcome. Thanks a lot, everyone. We really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Um, I apologize. 
a little so more soft-spoken than usual. I'm a little under the weather, but. Better, got it, cool. Um, and thanks again to Kyle and John for giving me this opportunity. Really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm Jim. I'm a UI designer and a web developer. And um, what business does that give me telling any of you about cryptography? Well, that's a good question. Um, hope you get something out of this. I hope people get something out of this who really don't know much about cryptography. Um, and if I'm lucky, the more expert types in the audience might get something else out of it too. We'll see. You can tell me afterwards how good of a job I did. Um, so, when we're talking about block ciphers, um, when we're talking about a block, we're talking about a fixed chunk of data, um, usually 16 bytes or 128 bits, and it, it can come in other flavors, but that's, that's the flavor that I'm going to be talking about. It's going to be in that context. Um, and a cipher, block cipher just consists of an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. Um, and you can represent that most simply like this, um, where we get, we get C by passing a, K, uh, a key K and plain text P into the encryption algorithm. Um, and then we just invert that to decrypt, passing the same key and the ciphertext back in. It's pretty basic. Um, hopefully that all makes sense at this point. Now, one note before I move on, um, let me grab my water. Um, it's important to keep in mind, uh, there's a notion, a security goal called indistinguishability, and that is um, the output of an encryption algorithm should be indistinguishable from a pseudo-random output. And if it's not, we've fallen short and there's some discernible pattern in that output that um, could lead to uh, totally revealing the plain text or revealing something about the plain text and we don't want that. So then, when we talk about uh, mode of operation, we're now talking about what are we doing when we're encrypting or decrypting uh, several blocks. And we're not, we're not just talking about encryption and decryption in general, but um, what is happening on the block level to each block as the encryption and decryption is happening. And this is crucial. This makes or breaks um, the entire setup, the entire crypto system. Um, even if the cipher is itself secure, if the mode is not selected well, then you're all screwed. Uh, so, start with the, the humble, almost modeless mode, electronic codebook. Um, electronic codebook mode uh, is described by the NIST recommendation for block cipher modes of operation from 2001. It's a pretty dry document. I hope you don't have to read it. Um, but it has this to say about it. The electronic codebook mode is a confidentiality mode that features, for a given key, the assignment of a fixed ciphertext block to each plaintext block, analogous to the assignment of code words in a codebook. So first of all, they mention confidentiality, and that's obviously a uh, security goal. And whether or not electronic codebook mode provides confidentiality, um, is questionable at best. But uh, another, I looked more into um, you know, what they meant by codebook exactly. And it, it's reminiscent of uh, Cold War spy stuff, really. Like he, I was reading about a, a, Russian, uh, a Russian codebook that was found. And it's just, you're going to have some fixed short phrase that is uh, in a, a stand-in for some longer set of instructions. And this is what it looks like. 
it's very basic and as far as the formula goes, it's not a big jump from how you would generally present encryption. <coughs> Except now we're talking about for some ciphertext block CI, we're going to pass in uh, some corresponding plain text block PI into the algorithm to get that. And decryption is the opposite there. So then the problem is we're always going to get the same output uh, no matter how many times we, we encrypt with this. If we, given the same key and the same plain text, the ciphertext is going to look exactly the same. And the most famous way of explaining the problem here is the famous ECB penguin, which some of you may have seen before. Um, and what's, what's happening here is the penguin on the right is the ECB encrypted version of the penguin on the left. Um, it's encrypted, but every, every similar and same pixel value is encrypted to the same, some other similar pixel value. Uh, and so there's clearly a pattern there. Um, this example is maybe a little, a little tired, so I, I decided, well, maybe I can try this, try one of my own here. Um, and so I, I tried Meyer and Cope, um, a Pittsburgh favorite. And what's interesting is the result's not the same. Um, if you look really closely, you still get, uh, you know, where there's this white area in the tag, you've got, you've got some similarly encrypted pixels there. Um, but the important thing is not uh, the things as they appear to us, because that's, that's a, kind of like a common sense worldview. And, and if we're going to have any kind of scientific approach to it, you have to look at uh, the values as they relate to each other. And rest assured, the pixel values um, on the right are not in any way um, devoid of a pattern. There is a pattern there. It's just not readily apparent. And so then again, okay, what's the problem here? I can't see Myron Cope. I could see the penguin. Like, you know, does, does it, why don't we all use ECB mode on a daily basis? Um, that might be best explained through um, a particular chosen plain text attack. Um, now there's, imagine there's some some old aging box somewhere that for some reason is still encrypting with ECB um, against everyone's best interests. So, you know, let's say um, I as an attacker, I can feed it some kind of input, S, and it gives me back these three ciphertext blocks. Um, so again, the formula here for some ciphertext block CI passing in the plain text um, and the key and encrypting it that way. So that's what's happening behind the scenes there. But more specifically, um, we also know that the plain text is a concatenation of S, which is our input, and S prime, which is some unknown input. Um, and that's what we'd really like to get. That's the juicy stuff. So that S prime is provided by the server or that, that terrible, terrible box out there in space. So then what if we fashioned a block uh, entirely of null bytes, but we, we left it one byte short? Um, what we can say about this first ciphertext block is then um, that, so we know, we know the plain text is some combination of what we're giving it and what the server is sticking in there. And more specifically, um, the, first, the first plain text block is going to be um, the zero through the 14th byte of S and the zeroth byte, the very first byte of S prime. So now we have a record in, in this output of what it looks like when the, we include the very first byte of S prime, some of that secret information. Um, again, at first, it might not seem like a big deal, but then at that point, you, you fill in this byte 
with all 256 possible byte values. And you cycle through them and you see what the, what the server gives you back. And whenever you get back this same block value again, you know that you know, whatever ASCII character is behind that, that corresponding value, you've hit on the actual uh, decrypted first byte of that plain text. And that's very bad, and you can um, very easily proceed throughout the rest of the block and other blocks in the same way. And you've totally broken it, and we didn't need to know the key. So ECB mode, don't use it or anything. Just don't use it. I won't make many recommendations tonight because I'm not an expert, but I can say that for, for sure. All right, so that brings us to cipher block chaining mode, which here's an attempt to not just let each block be some you know, stamped out deterministic output of the same, um, the same function over and over again, always revealing something about the plaintext, but something, some way of intertwining the blocks so that those patterns um, are hopefully totally eliminated. Now this was um, proposed in 1978 by Ersa, Meyer, Smith, and Tuckman. Uh, IBM owns the patent, but uh, the title was originally uh, message verification and transmission error detection by block chaining. And so they were concerned with increasingly complex networks with detecting errors. Um, and so there, there, was, there, was, there was more talk about error propagation um, before authenticated ciphers came into play. And that's the idea that, you know, when there's an error, how noticeable is it? Is it is it going to propagate to just one block? Um, is it going to propagate to all the blocks? Let's, let's look, though, at what this actually does. Um, so each plaintext block is forced, first XORed over the previous ciphertext block before being encrypted. Um, <coughs> And in the case of the first, the very first plain text block, well, there is no previous ciphertext block. There is this IV, an initialization vector. Um, it's very important that that does not get reused. Now, to give you an example of of the importance of the initialization vector. Um, if you encrypt the same message, oh yeah. Can everyone see that okay? Um, so if, you, if we encrypt the same message with the same key, um, but provide a different initialization vector, even off just by one byte, you end up with these, these two blocks being entirely different. And that's, um, that's the success of cipher block chaining mode, is that it, it does away with that determinism of ECB mode. And then we'd represent this this way with, instead of just passing in the plain text, we pass in the result of XORing the, some plain text block PI against um, the previous ciphertext block CI minus one. So this against that. And then for decryption, um, we're passing in the ciphertext directly into the decryption algorithm. Um, and then only then is it XORed against the previous ciphertext block to get us our plain text. And this is, this is an important part. Um, we're going to come back to this. But at this point, it's, it's the, the data is decrypted, but it's not readable. Um, because a crucial part of the process is that XOR. And so um, 
But you'll, you'll see where this comes up again. And so to, again, to wrap up our plain text, we, um, we end up passing in a ciphertext block into the decryption algorithm and then exit with that against the previous ciphertext block. Um, one interesting note is that this, the decryption here is parallelizable, meaning you can perform, um, or in, at least the, the first stage of it is. You, you can do all the decryption first and then um, XOR afterwards. But I'm going to explain that better in a different context, I promise. <laughs> So then, what's the problem with CBC mode? Um, the error propagation, which I'll, here, I'll explain that more too. Um, let's say there's an error in this byte, um, in, in this last position. Upon decryption, this entire block is going to be scrambled. Um, but its corresponding byte position will have an error in it in the next block. Um, and you end up opening yourself up to uh, bit flipping attacks to where you can, you can uh, if you have some kind of insight into what the plain text might be um, or what you might want it to be as an attacker, you can alter this byte in such a way to, and the classic example is, um, oh, I actually want to withdraw a million dollars that I don't have, so I'm going to add some extra zeros, you know, that kind of thing. Um, now is a good time to bring up padding. Uh, the PKCS number seven padding scheme. And this scheme states that um, if we've got some one or more bytes short in, in our last block, we can't feed that into the encryption algorithm because it wants a fixed size block. It's, it's just going to throw an error. It's not going to work. And so for however many bytes we need, that's the value of the byte. And so we need one byte at the end, and we're going to get, um, it's, it's a, it says one byte of a value one. And likewise, if we needed two, then we would then pad it with two bytes of value two. Um, one thing I initially overlooked when I was um, looking into padding and CBC mode was that the when you have um, when you don't have a padding issue technically you still need to provide a last block um, entirely padded with 16 in order to uh, make it valid in that scheme and so this padding ends up being uh, an attack vector for the padding oracle attack, um, originally pioneered by Serge Vaudenay in his paper, Security Flaws Induced by CBC Padding Applications to SSL, IPsec, WTLS, dot, 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 in 2002. People kind of forgot about it for a while, seemingly, um, because by the time 2010 rolled around, uh, Ruby on Rails and ASP.NET were using CBC mode and were vulnerable to padding oracle attacks. And so Giuliano Rizzo and Tai Duong published practical padding oracle attacks in that year. And that's when um, it finally got some attention and people started focusing on it. And eventually moving away from CBC mode probably as a result of that. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, tai Duong was also a uh, co-author of the Poodle attack against SSL and TLS, um, which itself involved another padding oracle. And um, there's, a, there's a great Moxie Marlin Spike blog post about, um, about padding oracles in part and how they just keep, seem to keep coming up and coming up. And you fix one, and then another one is enabled, and it's... it's uh, It'll come up later when I start talking about um, the cryptographic doom principle, as he calls it. And so then what is a padding oracle attack? Um, 
For one thing, this, we would consider this a chosen ciphertext attack because the attacker um, can choose what ciphertext to feed into the box and get back some kind of result. And so, um, let's say we've gotten a hold of some ciphertext blocks here. Uh, we feed it into the Oracle and it's going to check the padding and tell us whether it was valid or not. Um, actually, we're, you know, in, in a real world example um, from back in the day, it would probably be, you're only gonna get a code uh, if it's invalid, if I'm understanding that correctly. But for the sake of teaching, I'm gonna have two strings here that say valid and invalid. So then behind the scenes, again, here's our CBC formula. Um, get our plain text block. We're XORing uh, the corresponding ciphertext block against the previous ciphertext block. Um, and then that, that plain text is going into some, some padding validation function and returning valid or invalid. So then here's where things get a little interesting. If we deliberately alter the, uh, the last byte of the first block, which is, um, in this case, the initialization vector. So this is, this is gonna be sent in the clear anyway. It doesn't contain anything um, of any value. It's, it's just going to be a random value meant for, um, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, propagating randomness throughout the next blocks and getting rid of that determinism we saw with ECB. And so if we, if we, um, if we change that last byte, again, here's, here's our formula. Um, and more specifically, we're focusing on getting the, you know, the first plain text block, um, or index one rather, not the zeros. And so we're going to be um, exoring the result of decrypting the, the first ciphertext block against the previous ciphertext block. Uh, and then more specifically than that, um, if we're looking at just the 15th, index 15 of, of each of these values, um, we know what index 15 is of this because we, we decided that. That's not a mystery. Um, now let's say we're cycling through this and we're, we're trying different values for that last one. And uh, for the sake of explanation, let's say we got lucky with zero and we got valid padding. Um, what we also know then is that the, the last byte of that first plain text block is equal to one. That's, that's, the, um, that's what the, the, the valid padding message is telling us. And because XOR is a linear operation, we can rearrange the operands and we then know that that this here um, is just a matter of XORing these two values. And so once again, without a key, we've managed to uh, discern what, what the data is coming out of the decryption function. And all that's left to do there, I mean, we, we've since, we've altered this first ciphertext block, but we have the original if we weren't sloppy and lost it. So, uh, it's just a matter of exoring this value against the original byte value, and we have, again, um, the, the original plain text. And so, and this is a very fast attack, too, because you, you make, um, you know, 256 guesses at most per byte, and so it's, it's not... It's actually faster than, I won't be able to explain why, but it's faster than attacking ECB. And so this got, um, it's got CBC into a, a lot of hot water. And so people started moving, um, this is a very incomplete history, but started moving um, towards stream ciphers and reconsidering stream ciphers again. Even, and they had, they had a bad rap for other reasons, but. So well, this is not a talk on stream ciphers. So what's the deal, Jim? Well, counter mode is still a block cipher, but it 
it really wants to be a stream cipher. I'll explain why. Um, now, the earliest reference to a counter, though not counter mode specifically um, that I could find, was in um, a paper by Diffie and Hellman in 1979, Privacy and Authentication, an Introduction to Cryptography. Um, everybody says counter mode started there, and I believe them, because um, I have not read the entire paper, but it, it never, there's reference to a counter, but not counter mode. And so I think there's a lot of history, crypto history, that is just not on the internet. Um, so that's, that's for someone else to figure out. But um, counter mode um, being modeled after a stream cipher ends up taking, um, instead of encrypting the plain text, it, it encrypts a, a key stream. It creates this key stream, and the key stream is based on concatenations of a nonce, which is literally number only used once. Um, you can liken that to the initialization vector of CBC mode. Um, concatenation of that with a counter that increments for every block. Um, so that gets encrypted against some secret key, and then all the actual encryption is just a matter of XORing. Uh, the plain text against the key stream. And so it's, it's a very, it's very fast. Um, and then we can just, we can express it this way. That for some ciphertext block CI, we, um, we XOR the, the corresponding plain text block PI against um, the result of passing in the, the nonce and counter concatenation into the encryption algorithm. Um, and decryption is very similar. You just switch the plain text and the ciphertext there. Um, even, and here's, here's uh, one good thing about counter mode is that it doesn't need the, de the um, doesn't actually need the de decryption algorithm for say AES. Um, uh, it's, it's only ever encrypting the key stream and so that's one less thing to implement as far as getting things wrong, which no one wants to do with crypto. Um, so that's one benefit of using this. Also, no padding. Um, if we, if our last block is short, it doesn't matter because the, the encryption algorithm is still always taking a fixed block, 16 bytes. Um, and then the, we, just, we were just XOR whatever bytes there are here against however many we need. So we avoid the whole, whole class of attacks that would involve padding oracles. Um, also a benefit, um, this is fully parallelizable. So that, meaning we can, um, we can process each block in parallel, and we don't have to wait for any other block to finish before continuing. So that's a performance um, advantage there. Also, um, pre-processing, let's say I have, as a recipient, I've received the nonce, um, but I have not received the rest of the ciphertext. I can go ahead and compute the entire key stream and, um, and get that ready. And so there's an advantage there as well. Um, problem here is whenever the nonce gets reused, the whole thing falls apart. Um, and what that looks like is uh, these are uh, multiple ciphertexts encrypted against the same key stream. And so all these values here, and you can see, let me make it a little smaller so that the columns line up. Um, but if you look, check, check, check. This is better, okay. Um, in the first column, you can, see, you can see duplicate values. 
Um, and even if you didn't know for a fact that these were all encrypted against the same key stream, that should be, that's a big red flag there. Um, so, you know, we got 35, 35, we got um, 39 and 49 pop up again. And so you can start to uh, pick this apart and, and take guesses about, you know, what letters these might be. And you can, you can pick this whole thing apart manually like that, and it's not, it's not difficult. It does take a while, but um, it's just trial and error. And, you know, you, you guess that 49 might be A, and so you, you find out, you know, what you have to XOR 49 against to get A in ASCII, and then that's your keystream byte. You test that, and you, and you see uh, in that first position, um, you know, the first byte of every ciphertext there, like if, if that keystream byte checks out. If you're getting ASCII characters and, um, and you know it's English, then you're on the right track and you just continue from there. Um, that's, that's totally doable. Uh, the better way of doing it is attacking it statistically. And how you do that is um, you, would, you would take the shortest one and truncate them all down to that size. So, you know, say this one here. And you make a block of the first byte of every block, and you make a block of the second byte of every block. And, um, and so you end up with all these blocks that are all encrypted against the same keystream character. And then for each one you try XORing it against all two and you XOR them against blocks that consist of entirely of all the same byte. Uh, you do this with all 256 possible byte values, and you and you record what comes out of it. And um, on a, on the most basic level, if you get you can count spaces. If you're getting spaces, um, chances are you've got the keystream byte. And so you're actually going to recover the keystream with this. If if the keystream gets reused, you can recover the keystream. That's very bad. It's not. You've got the content and the key, so it's um, it's bad, but it's also fun to do. It's a lot of fun. Um, so anyway, that's the that's counter mode. That's um, and the, the danger of reusing the nonce. Does anyone have any questions so far? Yes. Back to the uh, ACB penguin. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that that would have had a different result if you had a much lower bit depth on the image of uh, like your attempt? Do you, do you think if it was like a you know, say grayscale or 256 bit something like that, that you would have had a much higher definition of the? Image? Um, I had considered that. Because my the first time I tried to encrypt Myron Cope, uh, it was it was a very low quality image, and I got the I got a very nondescript result out of it. And so I thought I better try a high res image, and I again got a nondescript result. So <coughs> I'm not sure what the trick is, but did, did that answer your question though? I think it did. Okay. All right. Ask me, ask me more later if, if you think of it. All right, so then that leaves us with, um, with Galois counter mode. And here's where we step into authenticated ciphers. Um, this was named for Évariste Galois, who was a 19th century mathematician who died when he was 20, but still managed to uh, do a lot with abstract algebra, which I know some of you know a lot about, but I, I really don't understand. But anybody who can do a lot before they're 20, they could just die and then leave behind this magical legacy is pretty impressive. Um, this was designed, Galois counter mode was designed by John Viega and David A. McGrew as an improvement to Carter Wegman counter mode, um, which is based on the Carter Wegman Mac uh, function. 
message authentication code. Um, that's that's a an interesting uh, setup that I would not be able to explain because I don't understand it enough. But I would highly recommend it to anyone uh, who finds this stuff interesting. So then, when we're talking about an authenticated cipher, we're talking about um, something that returns an authentication tag along with the cipher text, so that um, you know our these packets weren't tampered with. Um, and there wasn't any error along the way. Thanks, Jason. And so then, as far as representing authenticated encryption, um, it would return a ciphertext and tag pair um, instead of just a ciphertext. And likewise, in order to decrypt, uh, we need to provide the ciphertext and the tag um, to get our plain text. Uh, the basic security requirement here is that it should be impossible to forge a ciphertext and tag pair that this function will accept. And this setup is it's inherently stronger than a basic cipher for that reason, because you can't you can't just keep querying it um, with random malformed ciphertext like we saw with uh, the padding oracle attack. Um, it's it, so it, it wipes out certain classes of attacks entirely. Um, but then when we're talking about this. Um, Authenticated ciphers have the authentication layer and the encryption layer all wrapped up into one in a convenient way. Um, but it's worth talking about some other, to, to shine light on Galois counter modes, it's worth talking about some other ways of, of devising it for, for ciphers that don't actually include authentication. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, MAC is message authentication code. It's also the function that generates the message authentication code. I don't know why we, we use this term, but it's, it's confusing like that. And so there's, there's this arrangement, which um, where the ciphertext um, comes out like usual, but then the, the authentication tag is computed from the plain text. Um, and then because the security goal of a Mac is to make tags unforgeable and not necessarily to achieve pseudo random output um, devoid of pattern, then a tag computed from plain text could reveal something about the plain text. You can avoid it if you use a strong enough MAC algorithm like HMAC SHA 256. Um, but there is that possibility there if you're not careful. Um, there is another setup, MAC, then encrypt, uh, which is better as far as possible exposure of plain text through the tag. Um, but the ciphertext must be decrypted before you can compute the MAC. So um, you could be exposing, the recipient could be exposed to corrupt data. Um, and then the ideal scenario is where uh, the tag is computed directly from the ciphertext. There's nothing you have to do um, as far as some additional cryptographic operation in order to compute that. Um, and that is what Moxie Marlitz like, talks about when he mentions the, the cryptographic doom principle. And that the, the doom principle is if you have to do any additional cryptographic operation just in order to compute the MAC, something bad is going to happen. Um, and it's not like he, he lays out this proof of it, but he gives all these examples and, and you're very convinced of it by the end. I very, rec very much recommend that blog post. Um, it's worth noting that this is the approach that Galois counter mode uses uh, more or less, even though this is, again, this is, this is when, I won't be able to explain it any more than this, but um, this is an odd marriage of a cipher and authentication, um, kind of like, you know, bolting them together versus, um, having them all rolled up into one. Uh, before I actually 
uh, show you the diagram for GCM. It's when we, there are times when, uh, oftentimes, when we're going to want to just authenticate some data and not encrypt it. Uh, for example, a packet header. We don't want to encrypt that. It needs to get to where it's going. And we call that associated data. And so then um, we get this, I love that it says cat, I'm sorry. Um, but we get the ciphertext and the associated data, some, some packet header, and the authentication tag by passing in the key, the plain text, and the associated data. Um, and then we get, we get back our plain text and our packet header um, by passing all those in again. And if the tag doesn't compute, we're not getting that back. The benefits of uh, authentication. And so, here is, there are two basic layers here. Um, this top layer is essentially counter mode. Um, it does specify a 96-bit nonce, and so um, I have not seen any implementations of, of counter mode that, that had that, but certainly I don't, I don't see why you couldn't use that. This is getting into the weeds a bit, but so I find it interesting. And then, so we, this, is, this is all counter mode up here. And then once we get to the authentication part, we, here we're passing in um, our associated data, A, into the, the, uh, the ghash function, which I'll explain what that H is there. This is polynomial multiplication. Um, who knows what that is? Polynomial multiplication. Even Matt Marks doesn't know. You know, I imagine, you know, if, if anyone knew, okay. You do? Okay. I, I feel a little better now, because I really don't know what it is, but I know that it's, um, it's not easy for people to do, but there are specialized uh, machine code instructions for that. Um, it's, it's a C, CL malt, carryless multi multiplication. And so that's what's happening here is this, there's, this, there's this multiplication happening of that. And then it's XORed against the ciphertext, multiplied again, and, and so on. Um, and then finally, the length of the, of the packet header uh, and the ciphertext get concatenated and thrown in there, um, and then multiplied again, and finally, um, the zeroth uh, counter block is, is uh, getting passed in here. Notice it starts at one and not zero. Um, I really wish I understood more about G hash, but I can't say this much. Um, the H is, um, is a derived key, and you won't always see this um, in depictions of GCM, but um, what, it, what this is is the, we derive this hash, this hash key by encrypting um, an all zeroed out block. And so we're, if this is AES, we're almost treating AES here like a hash function, which is, has got to be one way um, so that it can't be forged. So, so that this is a security benefit because if this, if this key um, is compromised, then we've still got this key intact. So then, like where, this is, this is widely in use. Um, where does this fall short? Well, it's, it's still not misuse resistant in the same way as counter mode, which is if you reuse a nonce, then you're, you've got the same situation all over again. Um, because we are dealing with more implementation here, it's difficult to get it all right and uh, even the developers of OpenSSL managed to get it wrong and um, they allowed a bug to get into the code that allowed for forging Max, and that's, that's not good either. Um, and there are no slouches, so you know, this, is, this is something to contend with. Um, as far as performance goes, this is not going to be as fast as counter mode because um, 
the GHash function is slower uh, than encrypting against the keystream. So it's only as fast as, as GHash can do its computation. Um, it's worth noting that there's a, there's a faster um, and actually there's a mode that predates this an authenticated cipher called offset codebook mode. Um, it has not seen the same wide adoption as GCM because of its license, uh, but it's available for free if you, um, for non-commercial purposes. That's all I've got. Hope I didn't bore you. Thanks a lot for coming out. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, I just, I, I guess I have a question about when you have the, the graph of the server, how do you actually send a plain text and then see the, the encrypted one when you're in, are you, are you, I guess I'm just thinking about the real world scenario when this would happen. As send a plain text and then actually the, the encrypted text is visible to you so that you can reverse engineer it or that's a good question. So let me find that slide again. This is the one you're talking about? Yeah. Um, so this, this might be, when I was uh, first writing the code that would allow uh, for an attack like this, I, I started to think to myself the same thing. Like, what, what is this scenario? And this could be, uh, this could be a cookie. Okay. Um, and, and so, it's, you know, this, this could be session data. So this is... That's, that's where it starts to make sense, and I should have mentioned that. Um, yeah. But outside of that context, it's like, I mean, I've been, I've been, you know, reading so much cryptography lately out of a book that it's like, oh, of course this is, this is a scenario, but, you know, I have to keep track of, like, what is this in the real world? That's, that's a good question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, in, the, in the ones that have the nonce added uh, to the counter before being encrypted. Yes. Um, in order to decrypt those, uh, wouldn't you need each individual nonce value for each block? Um, I should have been more clear about that. That's the same nonce value. In each block. Yeah, and that is, that's an interesting thing about, um, in, in the arguments made to the NIST for counter mode, um, I forget who was making the argument, but the, uh, there were critics saying, well, look, we have an, es an essential component of this crypto system is, um, you know, deterministic input into the encryption algorithm. Like, doesn't this spell trouble? Um, but the, it, it's more about the, um, the, the strength of the cipher you're using. And for AES, that's, that's no issue. It's, it hasn't been broken, and it might not ever be broken. Um, and so as long as the key is secret, you know, a one-bit change to anything here totally changes the, the outcome of what comes out of this encryption algorithm. So it is actually safe to um, go ahead and feed the same nonce and a deterministic counter in there as long as the key is secret. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it would seem to make sense to use an initialization vector then to generate different nonce for each block, so that was maybe hmm. There might be a mode like that. There are a lot of different, different modes that, yeah. yeah. No, good question. Ah, thanks. That's it. I wouldn't have caught that. Anybody else? Yes. Do you have any anecdotes for where you tried to 
Oh, I do not. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I should say that uh, this is not part of my job. So um, I was prepared to fail sp spectacularly at this talk, <laughs> and then I, I, you know, I still may have. I might be deluding myself. But. Um, this is an efficient way of, of computing a uh, hash. Um, it's one little side note. Um, it, it's not, as far as like indistinguishability goes, and the, the output of that being um, not revealing anything about what you put into it, it doesn't meet that standard, um, I found out, but it's, it's efficient. And it's still, it's still secure as far as computing authentication tags. I, I'm, I answered your question as best I could, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, I was curious if it was called uh, Kawa because like, Kawa was the guy who found out There is, um, okay, so there, um, there are elements of what Galois field theory in that, in the math there, and I am totally abstaining from attempting to talk about any of that. Um, so they're there. They're there. They're latent and they're waiting for you. Thanks again, everyone. Very good